please join in the responsive call to worship from Psalm 66. Bless our God, O peoples, who has kept us among the living. For you, O God, have tested us. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer. Our hymn is number 139, Come Thou Almighty King. Please stand. God is a gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Because of our faith in God, we can come seeking forgiveness and new life. Let us ask God to forgive us as we pray together the prayer of confession, which is printed in the bulletin. It will be followed by a brief time of personal silent confession. Let us pray. Great God of the universe, who like a father promises us a wondrous inheritance and like a mother loves us unconditionally. We come before you acknowledging your holy majesty demonstrated to us in your creation and revealed to us fully in the face of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In him we have seen your glory and have come to know the depth breadth and height of your love. Such love summons us to respond in love, yet we confess we have not loved you with our whole heart, nor have we forgiven others as you have forgiven us. By your Holy Spirit, soften the hardness of our hearts 
and empower us to glorify you with heartfelt worship and humble service for the sake of Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ we are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen. be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian on this Lord's Day. I invite you to participate in the ritual of friendship on the center aisles or friendship pads. Uh, please take those pads, sign, and pass the pad along the pew all the way to the other end, observing the names of Rack on the center aisle. As I look out over the congregation, there are a number of guests and visitors with us, and we're glad that you are here. In front of you is a card with a red ribbon on it. It would be helpful to us if you would put that on, particularly helpful to those sitting in front of you or behind you who do not have the benefit of the friendship pad. If you're looking for a church home, we invite you to join with us in Christian discipleship. We've been serving our Lord from this site continuously since 1816. Uh, this is the second sanctuary building on this site. And so we have a long history of service uh, to Raleigh and the county and the state and yes, to the world. And folks come in from all over. Uh, the average person travels, uh, member, 10 and a half miles. Some live closer than that and others live farther than that. But we're glad that all of our members are here. And we invite you to join with us in ministry. This is a very uh, warm congregation and vital congregation as we engage in the ministry of Christ. If you'd like to speak with someone about how one does become a member, there will be an officer, an elder in the Balkan Parlor. That's where the coffee pot is. And that's where I usually end up since I'm a native New Orleanian. I love coffee. And that's at the end of the service. The Balkan Paul is the room as you come into the sanctuary area to your left right off of Salisbury Street. And we pastors will be there after we greet at the doors. In this room to my right will be a Stephen minister. We are a Stephen ministry congregation. And if you have a concern, because we're a church family, we want to know about that and assist. In the uh, pew racks or lavender cards for a prayer request, if there's anything heavy on your heart that you would like to Share with God through others who would pray for you and with you. You may fill out that card with that request. Put it in the offering plate or place it in one of the wooden boxes in the vestibules. And next Sunday, uh, there will be two more sessions, 10 minutes each, uh, for those who would like to be involved in intercessory prayer. It will be one right after the uh, first service and one right after Sunday school before this service in the chapel, 10 minutes. And you will sign a uh, letter of confidentiality as we engage in this very, very vital ministry. At the close of the service, we do invite you to uh, stay for some coffee and fellowship. Again, we welcome you to worship on this Sunday morning here at First Presbyterian Church. Our hymn is the hymn. <clears throat> in Christ there is no east or west, hymn 439. May we stand as we sing together. Thank you.
to call forward at this time three uh, young men uh, of whom this uh, church could be very proud. And you might even get a clue that they are Cub Scouts. And if their parents would like to come forward to them as well, their den mothers and uh, dads who have been with them. Well, I have been uh, working with them on the God and Me Award. We met three times. We had a field trip here to the church to see what the symbols and stained glass windows in our church say to, about God and Jesus to us. And uh, you all would be real proud. Our, our Presbyterian kids kept right up with the Baptist kid. Anytime there were questions, <laughs> and they did their homework. And uh, let's introduce them. They're uh, Matthew Gwynn and Rob, so we have Robert Fields first and his, his mom, Beth, a den mother, and, uh, and Rob. <coughs> And then we've got Wilson Hester and Becky and Reese, his folks, and Matthew Gwynn and Ken and Cynthia. And Sam, what's Sam's last name? Was that? Sam Ballard was uh, the fourth one. He's uh, with Hayes Barton Baptist Church. They all wrote me thank you notes, and they all said they liked learning about God. And Wilson wrote, I wish this wasn't over. Maybe when we are Weevilos, you will come back. Well, I'd be delighted. So I'm really proud of you guys. You did good work. There's your God and me pen. Congratulations. Wilson, congratulations. And Robert, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord Heavenly Father, we ask that you silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's first lesson comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. If you'd like to join in the day's reading, you may do so. There are pew Bibles located directly in front of you. The section of Peter relates to suffering for doing right. Let us hear now the word of God. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, are you blessed? Do not fear what they fear. And do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering is God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was also put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which that few eight persons were saved through water, and baptism which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our second lesson is our gospel lesson from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 15. In the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is giving encouragement to his disciples that though he will be separated from them through his death, he will not leave them defenseless. And indeed, in this passage is the phrase, which is the topic for our sermon, he will not leave them and us orphaned. Hear now God's word to us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who keep my commandments and keep them are, are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us? and not to the world. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine but is from the father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Precious God, on this Lord's Day, the sixth Sunday of the season of Easter, we gather for worship in the assurance that you will never abandon us. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I grew up, as many of you, reading the comic strip, and I still do. That's one of my favorite sections. I read that first to sort of get lightened up. I grew up reading the comic strip entitled uh, Little Orphan Annie. Now, as you know, Annie the orphan had the good fortune of finally having a wonderful home, a loving home, provided to her by a bigger-than-life character called, quote, Daddy Warbucks. And Daddy Warbucks had two unusual employees, if you remember the comic strip, the Asp, who's a strange-looking guy, and Punja. Well, they were house servants and, and, and guards. So when the play in the movie Annie came out several years back, Martha Dale and I went to see the movie, not the play, and relived some of our childhood because she, growing up in Mississippi, had too had read Little Orphan Annie. Well, at some point in early elementary age, uh, because of reading Little Orphan Annie, I finally got to the place where I was interested in definitions. So I asked my parents, what is an orphan? I'd been reading this, and, you know, but I didn't know what an orphan was. And so my parents told me, an orphan is a child whose parents have died, or an orphan is a child who has been abandoned. And I must admit, I didn't like the definition. It scared me. And so I asked the question to my parents, if anything happened to them, would my younger sister, Jean, and I be orphans? It scared me to think about being an orphan. It is scary to think about being an orphan. It is, a, it is scary to think that love and security and whatever is our web of relationships which comprises the family somehow disappears and we are cut off from those who formerly loved us. We, we were included, but now we're not included. We were noticed, but we're no longer noticed. We've been cut off from love and connection which nourished our lives. Couples from this congregation have traveled to, to Vietnam, to Korea, to Russia, to Romania, and other places to adopt a child 
so that that child would not be an orphan. They wanted a complete family, but they wanted to provide love to one who had been cut off, abandoned. In our gospel lesson from John, Jesus is reminding his disciples that even though he will die, in the front end of, our, uh, of this chapter, Jesus is telling them that he will go to heaven and there will be uh, in his house many, many mansions, many rooms. And they're disturbed by this because they don't know where that is. And so all through this section, Jesus gives encouragement to his disciples that even though he will be executed, even though he will die, they will not be disconnected from him. And the word he gives them is a word we need to hear. And Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. Well, what are the implications for that? The first focus for the sermon is this. We know we are not orphaned because of God's creation through Jesus Christ and because of God's salvation through Jesus Christ through the crucifixion and the resurrection. See, everything in John's gospel is funneled through the prologue. This is the, the basic premise, and everything flows from that pro prologue all the way through the gospel. The creation of the universe and our salvation are both tied to God's agape love, unselfish love, unconditional love, as that became revealed to us, not only through creation, natural revelation, but through Jesus the Christ. And we get the strong affirmation of why it is that we are not often at the very beginning of the gospel. We read, in the beginning was the word, and the Greek word is logos. It's the power of God, and the word was God. All things were made through him, meaning the logos. And without him was not anything made that was made. And the word, meaning that logos, the instrument of the creation, became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Creation was a love act. Creation create a relationship between God and what God created. Jesus as the Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. God did not create the universe and our solar system and abandon us to be orphans, to the vicissitudes of fate. No. We read about the nature of this love further on in John's Gospel. Three sixteen familiar words we learned in Sunday school or at home. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. What can make us orphans? All those things would disconnect us, alienation from each other, sin and death, whereby we feel alienated, we feel abandoned, we feel cut off. But what God does for us in Jesus Christ is to reconnect us. The author of the universe reconnects us through Jesus' ministry on earth, his death, his resurrection and ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are reconnected. Jesus says we will not be orphaned. There is a power to be inside of us to give us this sense of assurance. And we'll talk about that in the second point. Each Sunday we stand and say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe. And we say he descended into hell in that phrase as part of the Apostles' Creed. What, is that, what does that point to? He descended into hell. It's referring back to our epistle lesson from 1 Peter, read this morning. Peter, in that passage, talks about the way that Jesus suffered for us, the righteous for the unrighteous. And then he goes on with this very interesting phrase. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times would not obey. What does all that mean? What's the reference here? Well, scholars say it means this. Everyone who lived and died before Jesus was born at Bethlehem and crucified on the cross but before the resurrection had a personal encounter with the spirit of the Christ. He went to the spirits in prison 
The spirits in prison can also be translated in various texts as Hades, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Sheol, which means the place of the dead. Jesus went to the place of the dead, the spirits in prison, and proclaimed the good news of the gospel. No one was to escape hearing the forgiveness of God and the repentance of God, the good news of God's love. No one was to be abandoned. No one was to be cut off. No one was to be orphaned. The word hell we use in the Apostles' Creed is a poor substitute as a translation for the original text of the Apostles' Creed, which contains Hades or it sometimes even uses Sheol. The early Christian scholar Rufanus, around 400 AD, remind, uh, mentioned the phrase, quote, he descended into Hades as being part of the Apostles' Creed as used in baptismal services. When Jesus told his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned, that compassion, that love was so inclusive that it was made available to the spirits in prison. All who ever lived and died before he became flesh and died on a cross and was raised from the dead. No one, because of God's love, the creator of the universe, who became flesh as our savior, no one is to be orphaned because of the powers of sin and death. And that gives us a sense of assurance. Why is that? Well, in the second place, God's love revealed in Jesus Christ as our Savior places us in a variety of families, networks, herds, as we might use a sociological term uh, that uh, Carol Sloan used. The closing hymn this Sunday, or I should say the hymn we've already sung, reminds us, join hands, disciples of the faith, whatever your race may be, all children of the living God are surely kin to me. The creator of the universe and the one who came into the world about whom it was said God so loved the world has acted for all humankind. All children of the living God are surely kin to me. Because of what Jesus has done for us through the cross and the resurrection, defeating the powers of sin and death, giving us a living hope, we are connected to each other through him. And because of that, we are in a family, which is universal. The church is Catholic, we say. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. That's not a term only that the Roman Catholics use. We are Catholic Presbyterians, Catholic Methodists, because the word Catholic means universal. In our gospel lesson, Jesus was concerned for the welfare of the disciples who as a group were a network, a family, a spiritual kin form, who formed a spiritual kinship. And they had given up all to follow him. And they were, as we would be if we had done that, terrified at what was going to happen. And his death would be catastrophic and traumatic for them. But, Jesus is saying, before it happens, that would not be the end. They would not be disconnected. He would not leave them orphaned. And how he does this is by two ways. First, he will give them the gift of the Spirit. He will not be present, but the Spirit of God, the Spirit of himself will be present in their lives. It will be the treasure we carry about in ourselves, for the Spirit of God is what unites us. The Spirit is ubiquitous. It's everywhere at the same time. And because of Jesus Christ, those who accept Jesus Christ in faith have the gift of the Spirit. We're not orphaned. And secondly, he says, I will give you peace. Peace is this sense of security whereby we know that we are loved and connected. Peace I give to you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Whenever we are vulnerable, whenever we feel like we're not noticed, whenever we feel like we're cut off, we feel orphaned. But Jesus says, this is not the way it is to be. Being made in the image of God means that we were created for relationships in the human family. And how we live out our faith for each other is to communicate that no one is orphaned in the body of Christ. There's no one is orphaned, cut off if they're members of our own immediate families, blood families. This is why what we do each Sunday with the friendship pad is so important to know who's in worship with us. If they're a visitor, to welcome that person. If they're a member, to acknowledge who that person is. What we would not want to happen in our immediate families or in our circle of friends or with our colleagues at work is what we would not want to happen here at First Presbyterian for someone to feel, if they're absent because of illness or whatever reason, that they have been dropped in a crack. 
that they have not received any word of encouragement. And that would make them very insecure, even though they know that they're Christian connected by the Holy Spirit, but their church family has forgotten about them. We would not want that to happen. If someone in your household doesn't show up for breakfast, you know, surely you would check on them. If someone in the office does not show up for work and he or she has let it known, be known that they're not going to be going on vacation, they're not taking a sick day, someone in the office calls. We do it here. That's what happened with Minnie Hogue. She went home from work on Friday. She didn't show up for work on Monday. And her office called and no one answered. And they knew something was wrong. And they sent someone from the police department and she had died. But someone cared to call. This is why what we do on Sunday is important with the ritual of friendship. If someone sits next to us, and some of us have same, the same places, I can look out and almost tell where you are on Sunday morning. Almost, because my eyesight's getting bad. I can only see so many pews back now. But if someone is sitting next to you and suddenly they disappear, they're not here for one Sunday. Well, one Sunday, maybe you can, you can say, okay, but two Sundays, three Sundays, four Sundays. Well, they could be in Europe. They could be on the beach. They could be out west. Or they could be sick. Something could have happened. And for us not to notice is not to be a family. For us not to notice is for that person to sense that he or she has been abandoned, cut off. He or she has been offered. And we wouldn't want that for ourselves. And we do not want that for anyone in our community of faith. Yes, how we operate as members of the body of Christ reflects what it is out of gratitude God has done for us because we are placed in a family. The community of faith is a family. The body of Christ is a family. And when visitors come here from wherever they come from, they should not be seen as aliens. They should not feel like they've stepped into a place where, where they're not accepted as part of the family. Yes, they are, as we would want to be if we visited and worshiped somewhere else. We are not to be orphaned. You received in the mail from the Board of Deacons, first friends and family. A way for us geographically to be in touch with each other. And I trust that the deacons will be contacting you soon, introducing himself or herself to you. An important way for us to say that we are family. Because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, we are not orphaned. We care for each other and we contact each other and we know who we are. Well, important words of assurance given to us. You know, if you go out to Glen Eyre or to any retirement home and you've outlived your family and your friends, you want to be remembered. And what we do on communion when we serve to the homebound is so important because this is the contact people have to the body of Christ, to the people who show up. They're not orphaned, they're loved. And they're part of a family who cares. Through creation and our salvation, because of the love of God, we're not orphaned. And because of what God did for us through Jesus Christ, through the cross and resurrection, we're tied together by the gift of God's Spirit, who gives us peace, the sense of security. And we ought to live that on behalf of each other. In Christ there is no east or west. In him, no north or south. But one great fellowship, and you can substitute here, one great kinship of love throughout the whole wide earth. As we live, we need to feel that we are not orphaned. And Jesus gives us this assurance. He gave it then, and he gives it today, and he will give it down through the centuries of time until he comes again. I will not leave you orphaned, abandoned, cut off, Amen. Please stand as we affirm what we believe by saying together the historic Apostles' Creed. It is printed on page 14 in your hymnal. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let's come to God in a time of prayer, and we will conclude by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, we are humbly grateful that your presence remains with us still, even this morning in this place, a place filled with the music of voices raised in praise, music offered to you by organist Sue Crocker, the handbells, and even your own chorus of chirping birds. We pray that you'll continue to watch over Sue as she leaves for grad school, bless her efforts in becoming a teacher of young people, helping them discover their God-given gifts of voice and music. May they know they are loved through her compassion and patient teaching. Lord, help us all to see how we can choose to love even when we don't feel that loving. We can choose to be kind and gracious. We sheep aren't very lovable. Sheep are stinky and stupid, as Allie Park said on Youth Sunday. But Jesus came to live in our pen, and Christ remains with us still as the Holy Spirit abides with us and guides us. And we can continue to choose to be your loving people, especially if you will continue to smile upon us. Loving God, we pray for your compassionate care for our friends and colleagues who have lost dear loved ones this week. Even though there's joy over the great faithful lives these people lived, it still hurts to lose your dad or your good friend or your lifelong spouse. Please bless those who mourn. Let them be comforted. And we pray for those facing challenges and testing in the days ahead, be it final exams and papers or difficult decisions to make, issues to resolve. We pray that you will answer their prayers for wisdom and guidance and will give them a strong conscience grounded in the solid values of faith that we have learned through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his faithful ones to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Another time to revisit that uh, verse from In Christ There Is No East or West. Join hands, disciples of the faith, whatever your race may be. All children of the living God are surely kin to me. Let us join hands in loving service to the living God and all our kin as we present our morning offerings and tithes.
Gracious God, may we use these gifts to draw closer together to all our kinfolk and all our fellow critters, as the Bible says, especially the widows and orphans. May we strengthen our family ties through service in Christ's name. Amen. We've been saying goodbye to Sue Crocker all morning as she is about to leave us to go to grad school. And I presume by virtue of marital contract, Stan is leaving as well. <laughs> I would like to alert you, as the, as the bulletin says, Sue is going to play this spectacular piece for her postlude today that she played at her recital a year or so ago. It's a, a handwritten thing. It's not been published by John Weaver, an arrangement of For All the Saints. And if you listen carefully, you hear when the saints go marching in on the pedals, sometimes played with both feet. It's a, such a difficult uh, piece. Sue even had to practice it. So I think it would be a good show of respect for Sue and maybe even for God to remain seated for the postlude to hear Sue's final uh, postlude. We'll let her warm up as we sing uh, hymn number 376, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. <laughs>
leave the, with the assurance that no matter where we go, the Spirit of the living God is with us. We are never abandoned. We are never cut off from God. And we are never cut off from each other. So let us be extensions of the love of God to all within, all of the networks of families in which we reside, demonstrating God's love so that others too know that they <clears throat> are not orphaned. And now the grace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen.
thank those little fellas what they've done.